Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have three important papers in organic synthesis featuring deoxyfluorine chemistry. To provide an overview, first we'll be talking about deoxyfluorination of alcohols, carbonyls, and carboxylic acids, then we'll talk about deoxytrifluoromethylation, as well as deoxydifluoromethylation. The first paper for today is a review article discussing deoxyfluorination in all of its many forms. Quite often, a number of different deoxyfluorinating agents can be used, but the cheapest one is probably SF4, sulfur tetrafluoride. This can be easily prepared from sulfur dichloride and potassium fluoride. The downside is it's extremely toxic, it produces HF on contact with water, and it's a gas. So not ideal. As such, alternatives have been developed, such as DAST or deoxyfluor, however, these still have some problems. This led to the development of the crystal fluor or extal fluoris, but these aren't the only types of deoxyfluorinating agents that exist. A whole range of them have been prepared, such as phenofluor, pifluor, and fluolid, just to name a few. One example of the use of SF4 is in the conversion of aliphatic carboxylic acids to the corresponding trifluoromethyl groups. In some cases, when you use DAST or SF4, you'll be afforded with the corresponding acyl fluoride, but in these cases, under these conditions, the corresponding trifluoromethyl compound is prepared. In addition, benzoic and cinnamic acids are able to undergo deoxyfluorination, affording trifluoromethylarenes, as well as vinylagous trifluoromethyl groups. There are other ways to prepare acyl fluorides as well. In addition to the use of SF4 to prepare trifluoromethyl groups and acyl fluorides, there's milder reagents. This is one example of the use of tetramethylammonium SCF3 as a way to convert carboxylic acids into acyl fluorides. Sometimes these compounds are too reactive to be isolated, but in many cases they are still isolable. The mechanism of this is as follows. Initially, the SCF3 anion decomposes to thiofluorophosgene. Thiofluorophosgene is able to form a mixed anhydride with the corresponding carboxylic acid, liberating tetramethylammonium bifluoride. The resulting mixed anhydride is then able to be attacked by another carboxylic acid group, affording this dimer with a thiocarbonyl in between, enabling fluoride to attack and displace carbon oxysulfide as a byproduct, as well as liberating another equivalent of the carboxylate, which can then go to react further. Now in terms of aryl fluorinations, it's also possible to take a phenol and treat it with phenofluor in the presence of cesium fluoride to afford the corresponding aryl fluorides. This has been applied to a number of aryl fluorides as well as heteroaryl fluorides. There are other ways to make aryl fluorides, but I thought I'd mention this one here as occasionally this is something you want to do. In addition to the scope of aryl fluorides, it's also possible to prepare alkyl fluorides from the corresponding alcohols using phenofluor. Another way to make acyl fluorides is through the treatment of triphenylphosphine with N-bromosuccinamide, forming a bromotriphenylphosphonium cation. This is able to be attacked by the corresponding carboxylate, making an acyl oxyphosphonium ion, which can then be reacted with HF in the form of triethylamine trihf to afford the corresponding acyl fluoride. It's also possible to use copper to do deoxyfluorination. Using a copper-1 catalyst in the presence of copper-2 and DIC as an activator, it was possible to convert these alcohols into the corresponding alkyl fluorides. I'm not sure how generalizable this methodology is, but this is a method that I wasn't familiar with before reading this review. So this is how the authors were able to make this compound, but I wonder if today's sponsor Reaxis has any alternative ideas about how we can synthesize this molecule. Today we'll be examining the retrosynthesis planning tool of Reaxis. We can paste in our structure as a smile string directly from ChemDraw. When we're setting up our search, we can remove any published routes so that we only see the proposed routes that the Reaxis retrosynthesis planning tool makes. You can change the result of a prediction by playing with the diversity and the selected building block categories. The Reaxis retrosynthesis tool utilizes three neural networks trained on Reaxis data to generate synthesis plans. It breaks down product molecules into starting materials using extracted reaction rules, matching them against a library of building blocks. The algorithm iteratively resolves branches into available building blocks displaying predicted reaction steps along with literature examples based on similarity scores to estimate feasibility. Today we selected that one reaction step and one building block are allowed, and by deselecting the sigma library, we have the largest possible variation around our prediction. Starting with this aniline, it proposes that it could be brominated selectively, which is a reasonable assumption. NBS or BR2 in acetic acid are good suggestions as possible conditions. Next, it suggests aerylation via diazotization. Afterwards, the bromine is then reacted with a vinyl boronate through palladium cross-coupling. 
The newly installed alkene could be vicinally dihydroxylated using AD mix beta, which contains an osmium salt, and subsequently bis triflated using triflic anhydride. The substitution of the benzylic triflate by a fluoride source is the next step, although I would be concerned that there may be selectivity challenges between the benzylic triflate and the primary triflate. The primary triflate is then substituted by dibutylamine, and finally, we still need to install that alkene, so the ketone is olefinated through the use of a benzyl phosphonate. While this route certainly requires more steps than the one proposed in the paper, it may be helpful for understanding how these types of skeletons can be made. In any case, the retrosynthesis planning tool from Reaxis is able to help you come up with new ideas for your research. If you're interested in finding out more, you can click that link in the description. That way, Reaxis will know you came from here. I want to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel. Now, in terms of doing deoxyfluorination without the use of deoxyfluorinating agents, it's possible to go through a radical type mechanism. First, what these authors do is they take this tertiary alcohol and they convert it to the corresponding cesium oxalate salt. This cesium oxalate salt is then able to undergo photoredox conditions to generate a carbon-centered radical, which can then intercept a fluorine from NFSI and fluorodibenzene sulfonamide. So if you're having trouble with the deoxyfluorination, for instance, if you're getting elimination side reactions, you might want to look at this as a possible way to introduce fluorine instead, especially if you're just looking to get a little bit of a compound to test for subsequent studies. The second paper for today is the deoxytrifluoromethylation of aliphatic alcohols. The way that this reaction works is as follows. Initially, this alcohol is able to react with this NHC group, forming this NHC activated alcohol. Under photochemical conditions, iridium is able to be excited to its oxidant state. This is then able to convert the NHC-bound alcohol to the corresponding carbamate, which also liberates a carbon-centered radical. We'll come back to that in a moment. In the meantime, our copper-1 species is able to react with this sulfonium trifluoromethylating agent, which oxidizes the copper-1 to a copper-2 species. Once this copper-2 species with a CF3 group is present, this radical is able to add to the copper 2, forming a copper 3 species, followed by subsequent reductive elimination, affording the trifluoromethylated product 14, as well as regenerating the copper 1 catalyst. Overall, the scope of this chemistry was quite wide, especially coming from the Macmillan group, and this just highlights some of the different types of substrates that they demonstrated were able to be converted under their conditions. In addition, they showed that if they started with this pentaerythritol derived diol, they were able to first functionalize a heteroarene as they originally showed with their NHC chemistry, and subsequently functionalized the remaining alcohol under their trifluoromethylation conditions to afford product 54, just to show what's really possible with this. The next paper discusses the deoxydifluoromethylation of alcohols. This chemistry is quite similar to the chemistry that we just discussed from the Macmillan group, but instead of using a trifluoromethylating agent, they use a difluoromethylating agent, and they also prepare a few derivatives where they have an R group instead of just an H. Similar to before, we have this NHC reagent forming the activated alcohol, generates a carbon-centered radical, but instead of having a CF3 sulfonium species, they have the CF2H sulfone. This is then able to generate a CF2H radical, which can add to their copper 1 species, forming a copper 2 CF2H complex, which can then undergo oxidative addition from this alkyl radical to form a copper 3 species, followed by subsequent reductive elimination, affording product 14. As with before, this chemistry works quite well, tolerates a wide range of functional groups, and it's exciting to see where this chemistry will go moving forward. In addition to the difluoromethylation, they did some difluoroalkylation, where starting with an alcohol, they were able to prepare the sulfone derivatives and then undergo alpha fluorination to prepare these difluoroalkyl reagents. These difluoroalkyl reagents are how they prepared the substrates shown below. So if you're looking to make a substrate with a CF2 as opposed to a CF2H, this methodology is amenable to that as well. So to summarize, there's many different deoxyfluorinating agents which can be used to enhance your chemistry. Whether you're looking to use something like DAST or SF4, which is relatively cheap, or if you're looking to use something more specialized like NFSI under photoredox conditions, these papers have probably got you covered. If there's any papers you think I missed or you'd like to see in a future episode, make sure you comment down below because I'm always looking for interesting papers to read as well. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.